please. So the question then for the panel, let's assume that was a prosecutor's <laughs> opening argument. Um, if you were the judges, would you conclude genocide based on that argument? If not, why? Well, I would, uh, I would probably uh, uh, go, wouldn't go too much farther. I mean, I like the argument and my, my compliments uh, to our colleague. Uh, I like the way she hit all of the points that were necessary. I don't think she had to go that far uh, because, again, in this situation, in this particular case, it's always nice as a prosecutor to have the smoking gun. Uh, and challenges that Steve and I had in Sierra Leone is they never wrote anything down. They only spoke to each other. let us recall is what was prosecuted at Nuremberg and when we we talked a lot about Nuremberg I think if we're trying to highlight the hypocrisy of Nuremberg or what resulted from it in terms of the failure to address Kaplan what we really want to be doing is saying that if the Nazis committed crimes against humanity which is what Nuremberg said then maybe the Russians did too um, but Bill, genocide. Go, I know we're talking about that. I was <laughs> going to ask you a follow-up on crimes against humanity. Under modern definitions of crimes against humanity, it has to be an attack against a civilian population, since most of this was targeting military populations or former military with the intent that they not be able to rejoin the military. Would that be a crime against humanity? Well, these were civilians too, though. Right. I think the point was made that there were many civilians who were killed, and many of them were reserve officers who were there, in fact, um, in, in as much in a civilian capacity as anything because they were the intellectual leaders of the country. So I, I don't see a big problem with that. On the genocide, I think the difficulty is that uh, the genocide requires demonst demonstration of the intent to destroy the group. And there, you have to be able to make a distinction in law between racially or racist killing of people, which this may well have been, um, there's been a vivid demonstration of a racist, racist motive and the intent to destroy the group. And I think that's the weakness of the case that was set up. We have to have more evidence and some things have to be explained, such as why did the Soviet Union agree then to reconstitute Poland uh, subsequently if mm -hmm. they were so bent on destroying the Poland? Because they control it. Let me, let me jump in. First of all, uh, on the crime against humanity issue, and, and I mean, I, I agree there's, the, the case is very strong for crimes against humanity, even though a lot of individuals were, were soldiers. And of course, one element uh, is a widespread and systematic attack against a civilian population. And I think the kind of pattern of conduct which is, which is laid out here would, would, would give you that context of widespread and systematic. And then each of these murders is a, is a murder, is a crime against humanity. So I, I really don't have much question about that. I, I'm impressed with, uh, w with the argument, um, and you know, as, as a prosecutor, I, I'd like to bring this if I had an opportunity to do it, uh, in part because, I mean, uh, as, as, uh, as David and I dealt with in, in, in Sierra Leone, I mean, we had individuals that we could show were without question guilty of, in, in our view, we had a strong uh, confidence in our, in our, in our evidence, uh, uh, guilty of, of of, of sexual violence, of, of rape, and of, um, of uh, uh, sexual slavery, but we also saw another crime there in, in, in forced marriage, which uh, uh, wasn't specifically written down, which we uh, said this, this is another inhumane act under a crime against humanity, and we, uh, uh, we wanted to see if we could make some new law and establish some standards and, 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 and push the envelope. I mean, you don't, you don't do that when you're dealing with somebody that you don't have anything else on, but if you've got uh, solid cases on certain counts, uh, uh, pushing forward other counts to see if you can, uh, if you can win them uh, and, and establish a precedent uh, uh, that will be useful uh, in deterring these crimes in the future, uh, you do it. And, and we all try to do that, and certainly in the, in the Yugoslavia Tribunal. 
uh, great efforts were made in regard to uh, crimes in which the uh, Bosnian Muslim population were, were victims to have those uh, called genocide. Uh, it, the prosecutor was largely frustrated because judges would say this, uh, you know, going into a village and killing a bunch of men, women, and children uh, and then allowing others to escape in order to so-called ethnically cleanse to drive people off uh, uh, 50, 60, 80, 100 miles away in order to establish your own sort of pure greater Serbia. Uh, to many people sounds viscerally like that's genocide, but that's not. Uh, that's, uh, that's the crime against humanity of, of, of persecution, uh, maybe the crime against humanity of, of, of murder and, or extermination in certain, in, under certain facts. Um, but then the prosecutor did uh, at Srebrenica uh, in the Kerstic case and, and most recently in, in, in another case, uh, uh, succeed the Popovich case, in, and also the state court in, in, in Bosnia, the war crimes chamber. Uh, found that the killing of 8,000 men and boys at Srebrenica, uh, when the women and girls and uh, uh, the, the very young boys and, uh, and old men were put on buses and, and sent away to safety, at the same time in another safe area uh, some distance away, even though horrible things happened there, uh, the, uh, the same individuals weren't killed, um, the, the judges found that was, that was genocide. Uh, because we do have this, this word uh, in part. Mm -hmm. you, kill, you destroy them in whole or in part. Now, I think construct, figuring out exactly what that means, uh, in, in the context of what happened in Srebrenica, the judges found that uh, because of that population there and, and because they went after all the Muslims uh, and men and boys, which were people of, of service age, potentially that could have had arms, that might have, but not certainly uh, could have been involved in the conflict beforehand, but, but taking that, that group and, and, and killing them was genocide. I mean, I think that provides a, a, a pretty decent precedent for, for, for dealing with, with the genocide in the, uh, in the case of Katyn. Now, it's different, but there's also uh, some aspects of it that, that, that seem to me to be even more aggravated <laughs> in a way. And, uh, uh, what we had here, of course, was, was as I see it, and I, I've seen this in other instances, a, a crime of, of, of decapitation. I mean, you know, basically a selection of people who had, uh, were, were the, uh, you know, the, the people on whom a free Poland would rely in the future, uh, and they were destroyed. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we see the, the talent and the brilliance in this group, and, and, and you feel uh, the destruction of, of, of this people in such a significant part. Uh, I know, uh, talking to somebody earlier, they said, uh, you know, you, you came here and you started talking about, you know, Rwanda and all these other places, and we want to talk about what happened in, in 1940. Uh, but of course, we have to look at these, each of these cases, uh, and what they teach us. Uh, and, uh, and we've had other uh, situations that are reminiscent of this. I'm reminded in one of the, one of the crimes that led that had some role in what happened eventually in Rwanda. In 1972, the government uh, facing a small, uh, uh, the, the government of Burundi uh, facing a, a small group of, of Hutus, which they quickly defeated. And the government of Burundi at that time was, was, was controlled entirely by Tutsis, only 15% of the population. They decided to launch a, a crime in which more than 250,000 Hutus were killed. Now, the Hutus were 85% of the population. They couldn't kill them all. But they killed all the government ministers who were Hutu. They killed all the military officers that were Hutu. They marched into the, uh, the lycees and the schools, well, particularly the lycees, because those were kids that had gone on into high school, and they killed them and, and, and basically created a situation of, of destruction of, of the ability of, of, that, of, of the Hutu population uh, to, to, to act in, in the future at least for a generation in, in that society. Uh, this is what they're telling me in Bangladesh, that uh, just in the last hours before, uh, uh, before the surrender of the West Pakistani forces, these various militias went out and killed professors. They killed professionals. They killed, uh, essentially, the cream of the society. Even though they were going to lose the war, they didn't want this country to go on. Uh, those, are, those are aspects, I think, that, that suggest uh, a, a desire to, to destroy the group uh, in part as such, et cetera. 
that I think could give you an argument that, you, that you've got genocide here. Now, again, I don't want to, if, if I went to court and I, and I filed this, uh, and if at the end of the day they gave me uh, uh, 21,857 uh, uh, convictions for crimes against humanity, I wouldn't be angry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, I do think that, uh, that with genocide, uh, given what, certainly what's been established at Srebrenica, uh, this would be this would be worth a try. Thank you. David, you, uh, thank you. David, you indicated you wanted to add something. I just did. I uh, yeah. Arguable genocide, but I, I think Stephen makes a very another very good point, and that is is that uh, what we're here is to seek justice for those who have been destroyed horribly. Uh, again, we we're always kind of leaning towards genocide because it, it it in your minds it captures what you think is probably uh, the right thing to do. But in reality, uh, from a legal point of view, and Bill, Bill makes very important points, uh, in my mind, if I was a prosecutor as well, I would, in this modern era, I would have charged in the alternative so that I would get a conviction as opposed to, let's say I just charged genocide. Let's we just took the, the Captain Massacre and we just charged him with genocide. And if I don't prove that special intent, I'm out of court. There's an acquittal. So what we did in, in Sierra Leone, and it's a smart prosecutorial move, I'm sure you did it in Iowa, Steve, is you charge in the alternative so that it gives the trier of fact, be it a jury or be it a, uh, a tribunal, it gives them an ability to plug in the facts as have been proven into the crime that has been charged. So that if by chance through the evolution of a court process that can take sometimes years, Genocide seems to drift. We find things that it isn't going to raise to that level. You still have crimes against humanity. And I think that that's very important. And that when we're considering Katyn, you shouldn't feel badly about that. Because there has been justice done, that it is a crime against humanity, and that uh, uh, there has been justice. And because, again, it goes back to my semantic indifference tier level. Is genocide a more serious crime than a crime against humanity. In my mind, as a former chief prosecutor, uh, it's not. It's about justice and making sure the facts are appropriately uh, presented beyond a reasonable doubt so that there's also an appropriate historical record uh, related to what has taken place. Just one point on the legal thing, and, I was, uh, and it may be relatively unimportant, but um, uh, you know, I believe in charging uh, all of the crimes that, that apply if, if you can. I mean, not necessarily every crime site in every case, but if you, and, and, and at the Rwanda Tribunal, we almost always got convictions of genocide and crimes against humanity murder and crimes against humanity extermination. And if we had an armed conflict aspect of that particular thing, we sought a war crime for murder. Uh, the law is that uh, uh, you can get uh, multiple convictions for the same act as long as the elements are different and you prove each of those elements. Now, if the elements are exactly the same, you can't. Uh, and so, uh, but we want to reflect the, 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 all the criminal conduct. Maybe, maybe that's piling on. It doesn't add to the sentence or anything, but it still gives the world more guidance uh, uh, when they've only got part of that in the future. So we, we seek okay. it all. I want to let Bill interject, but I also want to ask you a question to address at the tail end of your interjection. Um, twice now, uh, David Crane has asked whether genocide really is uh, hierarchically superior, worst crime. And you wrote a book on genocide that you called the crime of crimes, which seemed to indicate that it was somehow worse than other crimes. And I wonder if you would comment on that as well as whatever you were about to say. Well, I was borrowing the expression from the judges at the Rwanda Tribunal who used it to, to speak about, about uh, the crime of genocide. Um, and I think I was making an observation that's not so much uh, a legal observation as one of policy. Um, because as the judges now have pointed out at the ad hoc tribunals, one cannot uh, determine from the statutes of the tribunals that there's a hierarchy between the, the crimes. And it's really more a question of, and this is uh, one of the great difficulties we have in international criminal law generally when we get into this exercise of trying to compare crimes as to which is more serious and which is less serious. Um, I, I don't know how well it goes over when Robert Jackson says we didn't, you know, it wouldn't even have been a good thing to prosecute Katun uh, against the Germans uh, because 
we had more serious crimes that were committed against the Poles, where many more people were killed. Um, but we do make those kinds of determinations, and I mean, I'm, I'm feeling a bit lonely here, surrounded by all these prosecutors, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let me but, but the prosecutors make these determinations. I, I want to make a point, though, about, uh, because the, the prosecutorial framework is only one way of approaching this question. And I want to give an example of a, of a recent, of victims of terrible crimes in recent years um, who were very wedded to a narrative where their, their victimization was described as genocide. I'm talking about the Bosnians. And the Bosnians were so determined that they went to the International Court of Justice with a case that they lost, essentially. Um, it's true that the International Court of Justice confirmed that the Srebrenica massacre, uh, that they would endorse the findings of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, labeling that genocide. But the war itself they said was not a genocidal war, and that was a devastating blow for them in a, in a moral sense, in a political sense. It was a humiliation for them, and it was because they asked for too much when you had a difficult legal argument to make. And so here, this is not a court. If, I would say if the, if the victims of Katun are thinking of going to the International Court of Justice to make out a case that they've got genocide in 1940, aside from the jurisdiction, the temporal jurisdictional issues, they ought to think very carefully because the worst thing that would have, the worst thing for the victims would be to try and fight that battle and lose it. With crimes against humanity and war crimes, you've got a battle that is, that's, that's easy, that's simple. You, you've got that one and it's not always, it's one thing for prosecutors to say, ah, oh, it's okay, I'm wearing suspenders and a belt, so the belt, you know, the belt breaks, my trousers aren't going to fall down. That's fair enough. That's their strategy, really. But when you're talking in the realm of, the, of the describing something in a, in a political sense, in a, in a theoretical sense, and one that has great consequences for the victims in terms of their perception, I think it's better to invest in trying to, in, 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 the, in the clear uh, argument, saying these were crimes against humanity, just like Nuremberg, and, and, and not to try and push an argument that's, that's fraught with difficulty. And can I ask you a follow-up on that? It's sort of a twist to that. Um, Robert Petit, who is the um, former prosecutor of the Cambodia Tribunal, spoke at this law school. Many of you actually, were, I think, were there. Um, one of the things he said was that there was extreme pressure on him to indict for genocide, and that he was not sure that the case of Cambodia technically was a genocide. And he said that he is afraid of two things. One, losing the case, which is what you were just suggesting. But he said he was almost more afraid that he'd win the case and there'd be bad law made. Hmm. What's the implication there, Bill? Um, you know, the, the, the concept of genocide and crimes against humanity is something that has been in flux since the words were invented. Both terms, within a few months, um, Genocide, by the way, as you all know, was invented by a, a Pole, Raphael Lemkin. Crimes Against Humanity, by the way, was uh, proposed to Robert Jackson by Hirsch Lauterpacht, who was born 30 kilometers north of Lvov, right? Mm -hmm. So they were both from Poland, actually, Lauterpacht and, and Lemkin. And, and those terms were created at about the same time, and they've had this strange relationship between them for the past 65 years. Um, and that could continue, but I think what's happened in the last 15 years or so is that the pressure to expand the definition of genocide, either by amending it to include political groups, which had long been proposed, or just to amend it in terms of expansive interpretations by judges, um, has been resisted generally by that. Generally. There are examples to the contrary, but someone looking at all the cases would say, generally, Judges have been conservative on this at a time when they haven't generally been conservative and where they've, they've given broad, broad, expansive interpretations of crimes against humanity. Something has happened for reasons that I don't fully understand, but where the, we've decided to kind of leave genocide alone and put all the energy into expanding the definition of crimes against humanity. Why that's happened, I can't explain. But that is what's happened legally. And if you, had to, if you had to choose between one of them, I'm sure my prosecutors would agree with me, if I gave you a choice, you've only got one, you can only put one charge, mm -hmm. you wouldn't put genocide. No. Right. 
but in alternative you would. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, well, uh, <laughs> if, you had, if you had these facts. Because I think the issue that um, I, um, to me it seems to be a difficulty is that we have s several, uh, several types of perpetrators. And clearly for some, genocide would not apply. Probably for those at the lower, lower levels, th those who actually implemented the killing, and those who were actually charged in the Russian pro prosecution. Those were the, the, the people who executed the order. So in that sense, for those perpetrators, he absolutely agree that th this qualifies as a crime against humanity, not a genocide. So can, can I add one, something? As this issue is unfolding and as people continue to reflect on how to deal with this legally, may I suggest that great attention be paid to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights where there have been a number of cases. We have two Katun cases now before the European Court of Human Rights, but there have also been many others dealing with uh, atrocities from that period, both post-1945 in places like Estonia and, uh, and Lithuania and pre-1945 during the war. There's a very important decision from eight months ago from the European Court of Human Rights, Kononov versus Latvia, of the Grand Chamber, which is like the Supreme Court there. I know this case well because I was the counsel to Latvia in that case. And in that case, the Euro the, Latvia had prosecuted uh, pro-Soviet partisan for atrocities committed in the Second World War. Um, and the Russians who intervened in the case argued that it couldn't, there couldn't be war crimes committed by the Russians because only Nazis could commit war crimes in the Second World War was essentially their position. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, you laugh, but they lost. Okay. Latvia lost at the, at the chamber uh, at first instance, four to three. And then uh, they, I got involved after that in the case before the Grand Chamber, and it was 14 to three. But three judges uh -huh. agreed with the Russian argument including the French judge. So, you know, these are, it's not a straightforward, I mean, you laugh, but it's not a straightforward mm -hmm. argument, but it's an important precedent. And there will be other cases. I think that Kononov is extremely helpful in terms of framing a case about, about Katun, for example. David, want to add something? Just real quickly, you know, uh, Steve brought up the, uh, uh, the challenge we found in West Africa when, we, when I originally arrived there. We had uh, bushwives that were, uh, uh, used throughout the conflict uh, up to the tune of over, over 35,000 women who were bushwives and girls. Uh, and we had a statutory listing of the things that we could charge, rape, sexual slavery, et cetera, terrorism, enslavement. But the facts didn't fit. There was something, it was a greater crime. And so I remember sitting around in a round table with my prosecutors, we just threw it on the table and said, I think there's something greater here. And then we just chatted. Uh, the beauty of uh, 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 crimes against humanity, at least in our statute, is and other inhumane acts. And so we focused on that and said, well, this is another inhumane act. And I, we all felt that legally we could uh, amend the indictments and get a, another charge put in. And then it was going around the room, well, what do we call this then? You know, we can't just call it bushwives. Uh, so it was amended to other inhumane acts and then we described the bushwife phenomenon and it was upheld throughout and Steve successfully finished up the prosecutions and got convictions, some very key convictions on this new crime against humanity called uh, forced marriage in times of armed conflict. So the crimes against humanity kind of uh, tier allows a prosecutor to fit the horror, the atrocity, that the circumstances that you're faced with a little bit better. Uh, genocide is very clearly defined and boxed in, whereas you can have much more flexibility with uh, crimes against humanity. And then we're not talking about war crimes here, but that's a whole nother, another thing. Now, I do want to add that. something about the, you know, it's, it's important to understand that the law is, is, is constantly developing, uh, both in terms of construing these conventions and determining what what, what custom is. Uh, you know, do keep in mind that uh, crimes against humanity are, don't come to us 
at least until the Statute of Rome in, in 1998, as written down by a Congress or a legislature anywhere. Uh, they're a matter of sort of determining what the law of civilized people was at the, at the time of their commission. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a challenging thing that we faced on, on crimes against humanity, and even like child uh, and uh, uh, crimes against humanity uh, uh, in dealing with uh, the issue of, uh, of bushwives. Uh, we had it also with war crimes and child soldiers because we had to show that, uh, uh, that by the 1990s, employing uh, children under the, fifth, under the age of 15 in, in, in military operations, it, had, had become essentially a violation of the law of, of civilized nations, and uh, uh, things do develop. One of the more intriguing things about Nuremberg, um, which always comes as a bit of a surprise to people, is that uh, the crimes that were prosecuted in Nuremberg uh, couldn't really include, and I could be corrected on this, uh, crimes against the German people by, by the Nazi government. Uh, the, the crimes uh, uh, were, uh, at that point, uh, uh, international, the Geneva Conventions applied to international armed conflict, and the war crimes are basically crimes against people of occupied countries. And crimes against humanity under the, under the Nuremberg Statute had to be tied to other crimes under the statute, which basically required that to be con coincident with one of the war crimes. And so the murder of 180,000 German Jews is really no part of, of, of the convictions at, at Nuremberg. That was still the law when the ICTY was established. Uh, that, that essentially the ICTY was only able to do crimes against humanity to the extent they related to war crimes. That prohibits the prosecutor now from dealing with certain crimes against, uh, uh, against Serbs uh, uh, in Kosovo uh, after the withdrawal of, of Milosevic's forces in 1999. But since that time, uh, in the Statute of Rome and in the other courts, we've now clearly established uh, that crimes against humanity don't have to be tied to a war crime. Additionally, uh, uh, war crimes since 1949 and Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, and particularly with the additional protocols, now uh, can uh, apply also to civil wars. And, and indeed, what's happening in much of the world now in terms of the worst atrocities, it's not in cross-border conflict. It's in places like the DRC and elsewhere. Uh, or in Rwanda with the genocide, with 800,000 people killed in a conflict that probably saw fewer than 100 soldiers die. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's in those places that you now have it. So the law develops, but uh, I think as, as we deal with crimes against humanity, and, and we saw that in the, in the media trial, I wanted to make sure that if I couldn't prove these people guilty of, of, of a genocidal campaign through the media, I could show that the media had been used uh, as, uh, to commit persecution as a crime against humanity by going after Hutu moderates, for instance. And so it's important to, to look at, at, at the, what, what you've got there and, and, and have the tools available. And I agree with Bill that it's in the area of crimes against humanity where we've seen the greatest expansion. Of, of, of the law, but uh, uh, even then, I think it's important that uh, where we can, uh, where the facts uh, can fit genocide, that we uh, that we attempt to to convict for that as well. Now, you know, Bill, a, did, uh, excuse me, just real quick, okay. as a footnote, and I hope I don't want to make you lose control here. I, I, but it, it just came up as I was listening to both of you uh, yesterday afternoon as I was flying down here from Syracuse. I said, "What would have happened if they'd have?" I, I'd have been a chief prosecutor. I just got appointed by the League of Nations or whatever, and I was dropped right into 1943 and said, prosecute what took place at Katyn. And I thought to myself, what international law was actually available to me physically at that time? And I was really kind of struck by, uh, uh, I thought immediately, well, certainly, the Probably not. <laughs> Nuremberg doesn't exist. We have to just take that whole concept out. What would I've actually used as international law to prosecute the Soviets uh, for what they did? And I ended up coming up with probably a violation of the laws and customs of war. Uh, and then I thought, well, what else? And then I then I went back to some of the things that were coming out of World War One and some things, three pashas and. Uh, uh, some allegations against the Kaiser, and I, I came up with potentially, what we, what, what, at the time, they called it uh, crimes against civilization, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of like a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I kind of stopped. Can, I mean, I, 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 
That was kind of the international kind of recognized law that was floating around at the time at the beginning of World War I is, yes, uh, if it was a war, there were certain courtesies that were extended to prisoners of war, et cetera, and certainly you couldn't intentionally target uh, civilians and you had to conduct your uh, 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 military actions using uh, military necessity and proportionality and discrimination and you couldn't use weapons that would cause unnecessary suffering. But actually trying to, pro you know, to, if I said, all right, you, you, these are the, you, I have Beria in my custody. And what would I charge him with at the, t at the law of the time? And I came up with just kind of like two things, uh, violations of the laws and customs of war, and maybe uh, try to get something called crime against civilization. But again, uh, I, I find it kind of st striking as to how much we have come uh, since, uh, since that time and that now as prosecutors we have a lot more tools so in the past 15 years and the jurisprudence and the precedent that's available. But I just thought I'd just throw that out there as uh, how much, how little that we would have had if we would have just dropped right in. If, I can, if I can comment on this, because from what I understand, and I don't have the text of the preamble to the gen Genocide Convention, but the preamble of the Genocide Convention recognizes this problem and spells out that <coughs> genocide has been the crime that ha this is the crime that has been with us since the beginning of humanity. Right, that's a good point. At so, all periods of human history. Exactly. <laughs> so it is only at this point that we are uh, defining it in a legal language, but it doesn't mean that it didn't occur and it didn't happen before. And by that preamble language, we are pulling the, the, the crimes of the past within, within the scope of the Genocide Convention. No, but what I was just saying is, is that that would have been, at that particular moment, probably a crime against civilization uh, with the same idea, because again... Uh, but, the and, and don't forget, David, that at Nuremberg, they had the same issue that you're talking about, but they were very ambitious and creative in creating the Nuremberg Statute to define the crime against humanity, and the Nuremberg Tribunal said, even though this is defined in a charter for the first time ever, we don't think there's an ex post facto problem because, and, and they had very creative uh, thought. They said if one murder is a mal and say crime, then surely 100,000 or a million murders also must be. Well, so I, don't, I, I don't disagree. They just took no. crimes against civilization concept and turned it into crimes yeah. against humanity. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same crime, I'm thinking. But now let me, you know, let me move to so another question, so because we're, okay. we're running out of time. Um, Bill, you did tell us one unique reason why it might be important to label that genocide, and that is that if you wanted to get a case to the International Court of Justice, the only vehicle would be through the Genocide Convention, but you've mentioned the risks that you might lose on the merits and also that the Genocide Convention might be interpreted as not applying um, before it came into force in 1948. Um, but let me ask, if we take away that, what are the other mechanisms that would be appropriate? Um, tomorrow, Alan Gerson's going to focus on civil liability, so we won't focus on that now. Um, but what about new ad hoc tribunals or truth commissions? Bill, you were on a truth commission. Um, or UN experts bodies or US congressional action, like in 1952. What are your thoughts on these other mechanisms? You've been there. Well, first of all, Although there are things about the crimes that we don't know, we have an admission now by the, by the Russians that they did it. Uh, I don't know that we need inquiries now to get to the, the bottom of that. There may be other facts that we'd like to develop, but I think that largely um, we agree. I mean, I, I haven't heard anybody here in the room. I, I realize this maybe is a, if, if we had a room full of Russians, there might be a little more argument. But I doubt it if they were sincere and intellectually honest that we'd have much argument. As I say, they've, they've admitted it and we have the documents. Um, I think the question really is whether you want to actually hold individuals responsible uh, before criminal courts, and that's an option. Um, there are still some people alive who could be prosecuted, although probably the numbers are dwindling and will continue to do so. In the case of the Armenians, they debate this and they recognize that really there's nobody left alive who could, who could be prosecuted for the Armenian genocide, but that's 25 years earlier. Um, I would say also on the International Court of Justice, just not wanting to leave that for a minute, 
No state has ever done this. But the International Court of Justice has jurisdiction over customary international law as well as over treaty law. And I've never seen any good reason why one state couldn't sue another for committing crimes against humanity. So that even if there are difficulties with genocide as a, as a legal concept and getting it to fit based on the existing case law of the International Court of Justice, um, the, the possibility of a case under crimes against humanity is also an interesting but one. Are Just one last Russia point. Russia and Poland party to the We have to check uh, how much you they've know? accepted the jurisdiction. I think Russia has accepted the jurisdiction. The, the compulsory Rome? jurisdiction. No, not the Statute of Rome. Oh, the no. compulsory jurisdiction the of the International Court of Justice because they were sued by Georgia. Right. Remember? So Russia. Everybody knows they were sued by Georgia uh, a couple of years ago. So I think you can get Russia. Um, I don't think that's a big obstacle. I want to say as well about the retroactivity, because this was David's point. It's true if you arrived in 1943, you'd be in the same position as the UN, as the United Nations War Crimes Commission and the Allies, you would have to make up the law. But they did make it up. Now if we look at 1940, there's no problem of retroactivity. There's no problem with crimes against humanity, war crimes, or genocide. It's not a problem. That's been established. If you want to go before 1939, you may have some arguments, but there's no problem with 1940. The problem with genocide is not one of retroactivity. It's just about fitting in the definition. Crimes against humanity, it's now well established, and the same with war crimes. So um, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm guilty of this now. I wouldn't waste any more time on the <laughs> retroactivity issue. I don't think that's a problem at all. Um, if I could ask Bill your question. Uh, what, what would you consider the, the weakest point to fit into the definition of genocide? Well, I don't have a case sure, but that supports Sure, but based on our this. discussion today. The, the weakness is, and this was, this was where the Srebrenica case crossed over the line, the Srebrenica, the, the, the International, Court of, uh, the International Tribun Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia said, and it was confirmed by the International Court of Justice, is that they were trying to exterminate Bosnian life in a small community. It wasn't that they were killing 7,000 people as part of the Bosnian masses. It was that in the particular circumstance, it was genocide because they were trying to destroy the community. So what's the community? that the Russians were trying to destroy when they murdered the, uh, the men at, at Katun. And I think that's the weakness. Can I reply to that? Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> this is not an element of the crime, but um, the proof that the genocide has succeeded. Because if you look at the, the territories we are discussing today, which is Eastern Poland, which has been incorporated to the Soviet Union after Yalta, okay, Today, those lands belong to Lithuania, Belarusia, and Ukraine. And we have a clear proof by looking at those lands that the na Polish national pattern on those lands has been destroyed. And that is what genocide is supposed to prevent. That's what Lemkin said. But it's, it's probably not the prevailing interpretation of the convention to say that you're destroying the life in the community. It has to involve the physical extermination of the people. And, uh, you well, know, I'm not trying to, yeah. to no, argue no. in a way for one side or another. I'm just trying to be what an academic's supposed to be, is to look at everything in a balanced way. I think there are, you asked me what the weaknesses are, and those are weaknesses. And you have to bear in mind, we're not just talking about a definition, uh, 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 but we're, we're talking about case law. We have a lot of case law now. And it's not that helpful to you, I don't think. I agree with Steve that, that the Srebrenica thing opens a door. But Steve, it's just opened a crack. No, I, I, I agree that it's just opened a crack. And I agree with Bill that, uh, that as, as horrendous as it seems uh, to, uh, to essentially, uh, essentially remove Polish uh, life from, from this, this, this part of what had been Poland, uh, we obviously have all of these decisions that have held that the efforts to, say, create a greater Serbia by cleansing and moving everyone out uh, uh, through, through acts of murder. Uh, uh, wasn't a genocide. It, it took, uh, in the case of Srebrenica, this destruction of this of this specific community, and it's uh, it's in that area where I'm trying to uh, uh, to say that in in, in the sort of uh, uh, selection of this group and the decapitation and, and the sort of way in which it was done, that you could uh, uh, you can you can uh, find an analogy and you may be able to succeed. 
uh, not to constantly go off into, into different situations. I mean, the issue is very alive today in Darfur, where, uh, as you all remember, the prosecutor uh, uh, sought an indictment, uh, sought an arrest warrant uh, uh, against uh, Omar al Bashir, the president uh, of, of, of Sudan, uh, in July of, of 2008 uh, for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And, uh, and then in March of 2009, the trial chamber said, the pretrial chamber said, no, no genocide. You know, you don't have, you've got, you know, a student, uh, you've got Darfuris uh, living safely in Khartoum. You didn't try to kill those. But, but then didn't the appeals chamber? And then, <laughs> indeed, the prosecutor appealed that, and, uh, and the appeals chamber uh, uh, gave him an arrest warrant, uh, or ordered uh, an arrest warrant, uh, charging a genocide. Uh, in, in that kind of situation, where indeed the attack is in a, a specific area, not all, uh, not all Darfuris are, 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 are targeted. Uh, people, uh, in many cases, are, are moved uh, uh, further out. Uh, you know, one can, I think, argue that what's, what's happening there is they're being moved into places where the conditions of life are uninhabitable, and it's like killing them. And, and the international community comes along and provides aid to help them not die. But, but the uh, appeals chamber didn't um, uh, did issue it. They just said that the pretrial chamber set the bar too high. Yeah. Take a lower standard, and we'll let you try and prove it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not very compelling. No, indeed. Right? And 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 here, uh, and I should uh, yeah exactly, Bill. Uh, this is this is not uh, Omar Al Bashir is not before the court <laughs> physically, and uh, and if he were, there'd be an opportunity to uh, to, to uh, fight to fight first of all whether an indictment will be confirmed on that grounds, and secondly whether he'd be convicted on it. This is just the first step. Uh, but the prosecutor uh, now has an arrest warrant against Omar al-Bashir in, in a case that, that frankly, uh, draws a new line. And so, the, as I say, the law can be moved in this area using the precedents that we've seen. Let's open it up to questions from the audience. You've been so patient, and um, as the last panel, look at all these questions. All right, wait for the microphone because there are still people upstairs and people are watching this all over the world because it's being webcast. And then as soon as the microphone comes, identify yourself, ask your question, and we'll have a response. Yes. My name is Gene Bach. I'm the Polish American Cultural Center. And I'm a little troubled with uh, Professor Sheba's uh, statement when he says uh, in 1946, uh, Stalin decided to let Poland uh, exist, even though as a communist country, I think you have to look at it that at the beginning of the war, when the Russians came to the eastern part of Poland, there was a different approach to eliminate all Polish elements from that area of Poland. Stalin made a statement, from what I've read, is that let's eradicate the bastard child of Versailles. Now that's a much stronger statement than Maria made uh, a little uh, while ago. So the issue of Poland <coughs> being allowed to exist in 1946 should not enter into the fact that, the St that Stalin had uh, an intent to eradicate all Polish people from the area that he controlled. Of course, he couldn't do anything on the German side because uh, that was up to them. So we have a clear intent to eliminate the Polish elements, Polish nations, Polish people from that, that area. So in my uh, estimation, it was a clear intent, and therefore it would fit the definition that was presented to us by Maria. Thank you. And I'd like your comment on it, please. Well, I'm, I'm making my comment on this in light not only of the, the definition, which we all can read, but the way it's been interpreted by the courts. And the courts have said that the attempt to, or the, the destruction, has to be the physical destruction in terms of the, the killing, the extermination of the people. That's basically the gist of all of the modern case law. And there have been sharp disagreements, because we have at the Yugoslavia Tribunal 
a dissenting judge in the Kerstich case, Judge Shahabuddin, who says, no, it's broader, but, but that's rejected. So we, we, we have a lot of cases. We have cases at the European Court of Human Rights as well. We've, we've had a lot of case law that sharpened our, our understanding of this. And the majority of the case law holds that it's got to involve physical extermination. So if that's the case, the statement by Stalin in 1939 to you know, destroy the bastard child of, the, of Versailles is about uh, eliminating a country, but not about murdering the inhabitants of the country. And you may like, you may, you may think that it's desirable that the, the elimination of a country is also deemed a genocide, but I'm just saying realistically in light of the case law, you have to find evidence of the physical extermination. I would say if, we, if Katun is really the strongest evidence we have of physical extermination, you ought to stand back from that assertion and say, well, does that really hold up? Um, is that what the intent was? Um, you have to exercise caution on all of this. And I mean, you use the word clear and everything, and we, everyone says it's a clear case. And maybe it's just the, the natural reaction of a, of a legal academic and, and a, a practicing lawyer. There's nothing's clear. Things aren't clear, and this one isn't clear either. So when I say, you ask me what are some of the weaknesses, and I say, OK, you have evidence that they tried to destroy Poland in 1939. And I have to take that into account with the fact that at some point, Poland returns. And I don't see this animus in the Soviet Union of wanting to destroy all the Poles. So how do you explain that? How do you, how do you explain, if they wanted to destroy all the Poles, why did, they, why did <laughs> Poland revive? <laughs> How about with the Jewish people? They still exist <laughs> because there were too many of us. <laughs> but very quickly, if you want to Very respond. quickly, yeah. The deportation of people from that area to Siberia was, a, to me, and I was one of them, mm -hmm. okay, a clear indication that they wanted these people dead. Maybe not dead on the spot because they still wanted to use them for uh, some useful purpose, but people don't survive gulags that well. Thank and you. Uh, if I may come, can I? Go ahead. Uh, I in my analysis, I presented uh, the focus on killings uh, when, when I discussed the genocide. But in the presentation on the scope of the crime, I was trying to show the uh, in. Uh, close connection actually that uh, deportations and killings were the two types of genocidal actions performed or executed at the same time so they need to be looked at together and due to time constraints I just had to limit myself. Would you like to uh, ask your question or make a presentation? Uh, because of my poor English uh, <laughs> I will... Sorry? Because of my poor English, uh, I will speak in Russian. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, with the help of the translator. Okay. Как представителю страны, которая совершила это преступление. The representative of a country who committed this crime. Возможно, мне следует молча выслушать мнение столь авторитетных специалистов. I probably ought to listen to the opinion of all the authoritative um, specialists in this area. Especially that I'm not a lawyer. But as a representative of a memorial uh, um, of a memorial group, I want to express our attitude toward this classification as a genocide. Katyn crime, uh, by, its, um, by its essence, has their uh, char characteristics of genocide. But, but this classification is very argu arguable from the formal, very narrow point of view. 
единственный документ, на основании которого можно рассматривать мотивы. The only document that shows the motive. Это записка Бери, о которой здесь уже говорилось. It's a notes of Beri, a one note of Beri that was mentioned today earlier. В этом тексте непосредственно прямым образом названа только одна мотивировка расстрела. In this in the text of this letter there was only one motive named political political motive based uh, where it's, it, it was said that all Polish um, prisoners of war were some um, they were um, Enemy the enemies. The yeah, no, I'm just trying to see. The, 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 Maria, you had it in your presentation. It was Im, like unchangeable and rooted enemies of Soviet. We have a text original in our booklet. Yes. So I think that would be good to refer yeah, to. Yeah, the booklet that they were. Uh, yeah, irredeemable, irredeemable enemies of Soviet power. Не как причина, не как мотив расстрела, а как одна из характеристик. Ethical feature in this note is mentioned not as a motive, but as one of the characteristics. Uh, вот той группы, о of, которой Берия доносит Сталин. Of this group that Beria was telling to Stalin. Uh, и таким образом этот документ дает возможность нашим оппонентам. А я имею в виду прежде всего российскую главную военную прокуратуру. And that's the um, opportunity for their opponents, which who is actually the chief Russian uh, prosecutor's, prose prosecutor's office, the opportunity to ссылаться на узкую трактовку определения преступления геноцида, которая дана в конвенции 48 -го года to rely on the narrow definition of genocide in the Convention of 1948. And they, he's, he's talking from the point of view of their um, conflict with the uh, our Russian, opposition. their opposition with Russian prosecution, prosecutor's office. And, and we see that it's to their benefit to argue, to keep arguing about this definition of genocide. Uh, because it gives her the which is easy to um, to deny this qualification if to apply the narrow definition of uh, convention. And that way the prosecution is trying to avoid discussion of the really important issues. Uh, which is actually the statute of limitation, which they keep denying. Uh, and the legal recognition, which was made by the victims of the so political of the political political repressions. Uh, and a legal establishment that the Stalin and Politburo were the real perpetrators of this crime. Therefore, they just avoiding the real the discussion of real issues by just arguing over the genocide application. He's finishing. Only some words. Qualification by points B and C 
статьи 6 Устава Международного военного трибунала. The classification of the Article 6 of International Military Tribunal. Points B and C. Points B and C. Как военное преступление. As a military crime. Как жестокое обращение с военнопленными. And, um, and cr cruel treatment of the prisoners of war. And uh, crimes against humanity. Uh, cruel treatment of civil population. It's m way much harder for the prosecution to challenge this. And they have very weak arguments. And therefore, uh, the, uh, the, the dispute whether cut cutting crime was a genocide for our internal uh, arguments, it's a dead end. It's not leading anywhere. Because the real issue that the, the classification of the art Article 6 of the new, new, new Charter of the Military of the, uh, of the Statute of the International Military um, Tribunal. The tribunal uh, talks about the statute of limitations, actually, that it's not even applicable right. here. Right, right. Thank you very much. All right, now, this is what we're going to do because the time is running out. I'm going to have everybody who wants to ask a question limit it to a minute, and everybody gets to ask it in a row, and then I'm going to have the speakers pick and choose among them, and we'll just finish up right at uh, um, 5.15 as suggested. So um, let's start back there. There's a lot of you, so keep it short. Can you guys keep notes? Kristina Kilkowska, Muzeum Wojska Polskiego. You're going to choose, but one of the questions is from the professor as well. Uh, an item which has remained unmentioned today and should have been mentioned is the Polish population of Eastern Poland that was renationalized as Soviet citizens after the invasion and was then arrested and charged with crimes as Soviet citizens. If they were not to be considered Soviet citizens, and that's possibly why the, also the base of people that were uh, transported out of Eastern Poland, quote, supposedly is lower. If these people were then to be considered as what they really were, Polish citizens, would that not aid in the issue of crimes against humanity? A, a, am I making sense to you? Do, are you understanding what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's the one thing. The other thing about discussion <coughs> of 1940 and not knowing uh, what law would be applicable, the Wehrmacht Arm Allied War Crimes Bureau, which existed since World War I and continued in operation in World War II, was the agency which was investigating the Katyn crime. So my question to you is, what law were they operating under in World War I and then in World War II? Thank you. Okay, we're going to continue to take the comments and questions. There's one back there. Please keep them very short. Uh, my name is Irv Feldman. In light of what we've heard today and in light of the fact that Poland could probably achieve a lot of political leverage by bringing a suit today against Russia in some international court. Why is it that Poland has not done that yet? Is it a matter of not having enough evidence? <laughs> is it a matter of fearing the outcome? Is it a matter of pressure from other countries? Is it a matter of Russia being so big and having the atomic bomb or something else? Right. Okay, that gentleman there. And we'll get there, we'll get there too. Mr. Adamczyk alone, it see, and the purpose of this conference seems to me is to lead us to, uh, maybe this for tomorrow, accountability and, and closure. Where do we go from here? My sense is the last question, 
uh, along the same lines of the last question, what are the, the legal and the political options? Should we pursue a case in the uh, International Court of Justice? So do, do the cases in the Strasbourg Court have any legs? Um, uh, the Russians haven't, uh, shouldn't they be accountable uh, politically? They've made some progress, but we've heard a lot of things the other way. And a lot of Poles, uh, <clears throat> I am merely a son of Poland, I'm a Polish-American, but I know a lot of people in Poland feel strongly about the U.S.'s response, not only in the war, but in, in cotton. Should the U.S. politically um, have a bit of a mea culpa uh, at some point? <coughs> Down here. Uh, my, my name is Rudra Kumar, and I'm a Tamil from Sri Lanka. This is from for Ambassador uh, Rapp. Uh, regarding the, what happened in Sri Lanka during the last phase, the State Department initially characterized as, a, as a alleged war crimes. Uh, now they also characterize as a crimes against humanity. Will you go to the extent to characterize it as a genocide, given the fact all the victims are Tamils and the perpetrators are Sinhalese? And if I uh, quote the ambassador, sorry, the Professor Williams thing, uh, actually it was physically destroy the community who live, that lived under the, in the rebel controlled area. That's a question and a brief observation. I think whether you characterize it as a crimes against humanity or genocide, uh, it, you said it may not, it doesn't matter, but what matters is the remedy. If you characterize it as a genocide, the remedy might vary because then that concerned group can say, okay, we have to live, we need a separate country. In fact, in the Kosovo case, the ICJ briefly touched that issue, but then they said that was not within the jurisdiction, so they didn't do it. So do we have one more question? Any, okay, last question. Uh, can it be inferred that the, the lesson of Katine is that uh, powerful countries can, can commit war crimes and, and be immune from prosecution? All right, so panelists, we have five minutes. If you'll each speak for about a minute and answer whichever question you prefer or tie up your comments as you want. We'll start with Maria. Yes, I, I have a quick answer to Mr. Feldman, I think. Why Poland hasn't prosecuted this case on the International Forum? To me, this is just a proof how effective the decapitation of the Polish nation was. Okay. Ambassador Rapp? Yes, well, I, I had the specific question on Sri Lanka, and obviously it's hard to answer in one minute. Uh, you can find the, the reports that my office and the State Department did uh, on the crimes. Uh, we're still waiting. And, and pressing uh, for accountability for, uh, uh, for, for what happened there. Uh, we were not called upon to make a legal conclusion, but to lay out uh, what, what evidence uh, we had and what kind of crimes they could be. And, and, and that certainly included uh, war crimes and, and crimes against humanity. Uh, the, the genocide question is a more complicated one in this situation. Obviously, there was a, 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 an impact on, on exclusively uh, Tamils uh, during this period, uh, but there were many other Tamils uh, uh, in other places that at that period weren't attacked and uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, even though we had this long period of detention, uh, uh, Tamils have, are, are released. And so it's, it's, not, it, it's one of these situations where as, as we look at the law, it would really be uh, beyond uh, where the law is now. So that's not how the people have focused on it. Uh, finally, uh, in regard to this question about can powerful countries commit war crimes, well, the, the aspect, the important thing is, as we've developed international humanitarian law uh, is to recognize that, the, that these crimes uh, exist, I mean, that, that, that the, the, these uh, sorts of conduct violate the laws of all nations and that uh, for a country uh, to commit to attack a, a, an unarmed civilian population even within a civil war is, is not a domestic matter anymore. It's an international matter. Uh, to, uh, uh, to commit crimes against humanity or genocide within your own country is, is, uh, is still a, uh, a matter of international concern. And uh, however, the, the, the system in the world is that, uh, and, and recognized by the ICC statute explicitly and by custom uh, universally, is that the obligation is first and foremost on the state themselves to prosecute. Uh, we have in America a system of, of war crimes prosecutions and court martials for military individuals and, and, and other cases where uh, we do prosecute uh, uh, officers and others that, that commit these crimes. And it's only, it only goes to the international level uh, when, uh, when there's no will or capacity to do it. 
but uh, I submit that uh, the law applies. It, 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 however, isn't uniformly enforced in, in every country, and that's, uh, and that's why we're continuing uh, uh, these international efforts uh, to ensure that it is. Bill Chavis. Well, the question of uh, there being a justice for small countries or for losers in wars and not for the big countries is one of the great mysteries of international criminal justice, and it's a work in progress and it's unresolved. Uh, at Nuremberg, uh, Jackson explained uh, when he was questioned by the, the, the select committee, why didn't they prosecute the, the Russians for a uh, captain? And the reason was that they had no jurisdiction because they had defined the tribunal as being only for the major war criminals of the European axis. That changed uh, at the Yugoslavia tribunal where it was any crime committed on the territory of the former Yugoslavian, as Steve explained earlier. The U.S. had a bit of a close scrape there, not that they probably would have been convicted, but, but certainly to the surprise of many, it turns out, the court did have jurisdiction over the acts of the American Air Force in, in Kosovo in, in, or in Yugoslavia in, in 1999. Um, my commitment to this whole process is because I believe that one day we really will have a genuine system of justice that works for the against the big countries as well as for the weak ones. And, uh, but it's something that we have to struggle for. I think that Katun is a good example because I think you've got the Russians by the short and curlies, as we say. They've admitted the crime, which is more than we can say about the Turks and some other uh, people. And we do have judicial mechanisms that enable us to get our fingernails into them, like the European Court of Human Rights. So let's keep going, do it in a smart and a strategic way and it will help to advance the idea that even big countries, even permanent members of the Security Council, I won't name any of the other four, <laughs> could eventually be held accountable. And then we'll all be much more committed to the effectiveness of international justice because we realize that it works for everybody and will be a better world for it. And the last word goes to David Crane. I just answered the question uh, related to what was the law extant at the time. It was the laws and customs and courtesies of, of war with the Hague Rules of 1907. I could give you a history lecture. So there, there was a, a body of law which governed conduct on the battlefield. Uh, as far as uh, uh, I agree, we eventually will get to the point where uh, large countries will be held accountable. It is a challenge. Uh, if a double standard appears to be developing, uh, modern international criminal law and all of the great advances that we have started over the past 15 years will begin to crumble because again it's smaller countries versus bigger countries. You know, who's going to take on China for their human rights violations in the Olympics where they moved whole peoples to the east uh, of their country never to be seen again. They cleaned out Beijing. You know, who's going to take on a, a larger country uh, related to their particular human rights problems? Who's going to take on the United States for their human rights problems or their aggressive war in Iraq. Uh, and then, of course, uh, at the bottom line is, is that uh, modern international criminal law, the bright red thread of, of how states act related to atrocity uh, is politics. Right. Well, first, um, please join me in thanking this panel. It's a great wrap-up panel. If you really want to wrestle with these issues, I invite you back tomorrow morning. We're going to be across the hall in a... Tomorrow morning. Uh, yep. <laughs> we're going to be across the hall in a uh, circle, and we're going to be debating these for two and a half hours and creating an expert's report. Um, I want, before you run off, to uh, thank some people that made this possible. Um, Alice Simon, who's there. Darren, who's uh, run off. And Nancy Pratt. Our AV team, which does such a great job of beaming this That's, around the uh, world. That probably calmed the drug wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the uh, co-sponsors, and then everybody so who was a panelist, can you just all stand up collectively? <laughs> well, you know in French when they talk uh, about All the panelists. It on drugs. Please. 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 All right, Thank with that, I right. declare this uh, day of the conference over. Thank you very much.